you want to go ahead and share your presentation, Eureka? Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, which stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're very pleased that you could be with us today. Um, we're especially pleased uh, to welcome our presenters today, uh, Julika Voss of Bioconsult SH, um, Eric Hoyt of the Whale and Dolphin Conservation and the IUCN Marine Mammal Protected Areas Task Force, and Oh, sorry, K Carolyn. I haven't. Uh, Carolyn Hoschel, who is also with Bioconsult SH. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how the webinar will run. Um, we will have a formal presentation and then we'll have time for question and answer. Um, you can send in your questions uh, either through the question panel uh, in Zoom or through the chat interface. Um, it's a little bit easier to moderate them in the question panel, but um, if you send it in the chat interface, uh, it also gives others an opportunity to weigh in other attendees. Um, so either one is fine. Um, with the chat, you are able to uh, share your input with all of the attendees. We just ask that you be respectful when using this, keep it professional and on the topic, but feel free to share resources that are relevant, experiences you have that are relevant, and, and other um, input for the uh, presenters. Okay, well, well, thank you very much to the presenters, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. I'll turn it over to them now. Uh, Ulika, you are muted. Usually, yes, you are muted still. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to share my slides again. I you hope you can see my slides now and you can also hear me. Yes, we can. Yep. Great. Great. Thank you so much. I would like to talk about space whale again. And actually, we are using satellite imagery to survey whales from space in remote areas and thus to enhance conservation efforts. Space whale is a project which is run by Bioconsult, a German company, and our sister company, Haida, from the UK. I guess most of you know that more than 70% of the Earth is covered by water. But if you have a closer look, most of these waters are actually international waters, so really far offshore. And this is why we really have a small global survey effort, as this map is showing. So you can see here in the high seas, nearly no monitoring is done. And this is why we usually say about 80% of our oceans are unexplored. On the other hand, we aim to protect 30% of our oceans until 2030, so six years left. But where to actually designate these areas if we have basically no idea where a high biodiversity is? And our lack of information is mainly due to the traditional survey methods. We used to do ship-based transect surveys or aerial surveys or passive acoustic monitoring. But most of these methodologies are really limited to sure. And this is why we are using satellite imagery. So with satellite imagery, we can nearly go into any area of the world, zoom in and have a look where the whales are. And this is mainly what Spacewell is doing. So we are detecting whales from space using satellites, and this is what we offer as a service. We use whales as indicators for a high biodiversity and then can determine their number, where they are, and when they are in certain areas. And we can do this in areas where it's too challenging for traditional survey methods. These information then can be used for baseline studies, population assessments, and conservation efforts, helping evidence-based decision-making. The satellite we use or so far is mainly the Worldview 3 satellite by Maxa, which has a resolution of 31 centimeters. However, we also already use the Worldview 2 satellite by Maxa and the Pleiades Neo satellite by Airbus. And now you might wonder, well, how does it look, where you look from space in 31 centimeter resolution? So I'm gonna show you a few examples now. On the right hand side, you will always have the satellite imagery and on the left-hand side, you will always have a drone footage, just like for giving you a rough idea what you will see in the satellite imagery. And this actually is a blue whale in a satellite imagery. 
So here you can see the head of the whale, the flippers, and the fluke of the whale. We also always roughly measure the animals, and this blue whale, for example, had a length of about 26 meters. And this is a perfect picture of a blue whale because it's completely on the water surface. But if you have been on a boat before, you know that most time, times um, you only see parts of the whale. And this is also what we often see in satellite imagery. So here again, a blue whale, and you can see that the back of the whale is above the water surface and the head of the whale is already beneath the water surface. So we are also able to see these kind of behavior in satellite imagery. And blue whales are quite nice species for having a look in satellite imagery because they are not really uh, playful. But then you have species like humpback whales. And I think if you've seen a whale on TV, you've probably seen a humpback whale because they are quite famous for their active behavior, like creating waves, playing around. As you can see here, for example, slapping their flipper on the water surface. But this is also what we can see in satellite imagery. So here the whale is laying like this part over here, and then raising its flipper out of the water. So we can even see this kind of behavior in satellite imagery. And when humpback whales go down, they often raise their fluke out of the water. This is also what we see in satellite imagery. So here you can see the shape of the fluke of the humpback whale. And now you might imagine, or you can imagine that if you look for these features in a satellite imagery of, let's say, 4,000 square kilometers, it's going to be really exhausting, just like searching for these features manually. This is why we said we need to train an algorithm. But when we started, nearly nobody was interested in satellite imagery from the ocean. So if you've seen satellite imagery before, I think you've mainly seen it from wars or from environmental catastrophes, but not from the ocean because it's mainly water. So there was no training data how to tr actually train an algorithm. But we also do aerial surveys and we use this footage from aerial surveys, which is actually collected in two centimeter resolution and downsample this to the resolution of the satellite. Later on, we also um, contacted various scientists all over the world um, and asked for drone footage from various species um, to further enhance the algorithm. And now, obviously, we've already conducted several successful projects. So we use these satellite imagery to further enhance the algorithm. But you can also imagine if you have, or if you need to train an algorithm, and then the algorithm has to detect the whale irrespectively of it's just like showing the complete blue whale or only the fluke of the humpback whale, it might be quite difficult for an algorithm to really see these features. So this is why we said, okay, we are using artificial intelligence to really detect the objects. But then in the second step, we are also doing uh, expert uh, review. So they are doing uh, quality assurance to really verify that the objects which were identified by the algorithm are really whales and not confused with other objects such as boats, rocks, or foam. Why do we use a semi-automated approach like combining AI and the manual review? Well, our space well algorithm detected a further 13 whales that were missed in an independent manual review. So it really shows you need the kind of AI which is really detecting the objects but because manual reviewers will get exhausted if they are experienced and just like seeing so many images of water. Also, satellite providers offer platforms where you can do citizen science and crowdsourcing. And this is really well suited to investigate in large areas of open water, but there are also a lot of false detections. So if you're not trained in de uh, distinguishing if it's a wave or a whale, people might say, well, this is a whale and actually it's a wave or the other way around. So this is why you really need expert reviewers. And then by combining the AI, so making sure that every object which might be a whale is detected, and then afterwards an expert manual review, we really provide comparable data which can be which are reproducible, and then also quality check data. So this is our kind of approach, how we collect the data. And this is also what we did already in all of these study areas, which are shown here on the map. And I would like to give you one example of a study we did over here in New Zealand. And actually, I guess you're familiar with the shape of the New Zealand. We did a study over here in Auckland Island. 
And mainly we had a look on the northern region, which is called Port Ross. And Port Ross comes with some history, as it was one of the former whaling grounds. So numbers of southern right whales dramatically declined in the first half of the 19th century. Now numbers start to increase again, but obviously you have upcoming threats like noise pollution, decreased food availability, climate change, and so on. So it's really important to continue monitoring. We had a look on Worldview 2 imagery, so even the lower, uh, even 46 centimeter resolution instead of 31 centimeter resolution. And I guess you already saw the way here, but I would like to focus on the way here. So here, the white part, actually, it's kind of the head of the whale, then the flippers and the back of the whale, but then you can see something white over here as well. And this actually is a calf beneath the mother. So we were really able to see mother calf pairs within this region. This is then how we created our distribution map. So we distinguish between adults and calves. And also, even for experienced reviewers, sometimes if it's difficult to say if it is a whale or not. So we have different likelihoods categories. We have definite whales, we have likely whales, and we have possible whales. And for further analysis, we only take into account the definite and the likely whales. But now we were wondering like how reliable are our data so this is why we contacted local researchers and we were really lucky because they did a study within our study area and we were even more lucky because they did a boat-based survey one day or 12 hours before we did our satellite survey and when we compared number we observe really similar numbers in adults and calves, and we both observe 41 southern right whales in total. So we showed that our data were comparable to the results of traditional survey methods, and that Spacewell can either complement the data in explored regions or provide baseline data in unexplored regions. And this is also what we mainly do with Spacewell. So we can provide data for finding solutions for combining species conservation with the human use of the seas. So for example, environmental impact assessments for offshore wind farms. We can provide a tool for mandatory baseline monitoring of whale populations, for example, uh, regarding the SDG goals or on behalf of the International Whaling Commissions. And we can provide or fill knowledge gaps and thus enhance conservation, like designating marine protected areas. Spacewell started in 2018, and we were co financed by the European Space Agency twice. And within this time, we validated our methodologies. We did several pilot projects. And then in 2022, we teamed up with Deloitte and Whale and Dolphin Conservation, where Eric is here today. And actually, they asked, well, is there anybody who can see whales from space to know where they are and when they are in certain areas to really use these data for conservation? And we said, well, we can. So this is why we actually started working together, because whale and dolphin conservation can use our data for creating important marine mammal areas, creating marine protected areas, or, for example, for supporting redirecting fishing and shipping traffic in critical areas. Therefore, at the moment, we are conducting a proof of concept study in the Indian Ocean. So we got a grant for a study area of 4000 square kilometers of satellite imagery. Um, and we have several um, data collections going on in the moment on various study areas in the Indian Ocean with various cetacean species. And we kind of assume what kind of whales there will be but obviously we really have a lack of data in these regions because so we don't know and this is also the reason why the areas are so far only designated as ecologically or biologically significant ar marine areas but not for example as marine protected areas because we are really lacking of data and this is why you cannot go further steps in marine conservation so what we do is that we use whales as indicators for a high biodiversity because we know what, when there are a lot of whales, there's probably also a lot of fish and phytoplankton and so on. And our aim is really that our data will lead to a designation of, of these areas as important marine mammal areas, where Eric will talk a bit later on, as well as marine protected areas. But obviously, this also really depends on the results. And really the added value of satellite imagery is that we can go into the areas where no boat has ever been before because it's so far offshore. So we can really fill the knowledge gaps we need to fill for reaching the 30 by 30 target, like 
uh, protecting 30% of our oceans until 2030. I would like to end with this slide. So we are always on the lookout for, firstly, drone footage from whales and dolphins to further enhance the algorithm. Obviously, we are also always searching for collaborations with local people and organizations because we can deliver the data for designating marine protected areas. But obviously, it's also really important that the areas are not only designated as marine protected areas, but afterwards also managed as marine protected areas. And then also we are always on the lookout for partners from the financial sector, from philanthropic organizations, or with good contacts to satellite providers for further price negotiations regarding satellite imagery. Um, the good message is that we have the tools to fill the knowledge gap. So I started saying like more than 80% of our ocean is unexplored. And this sounds quite negative, but we can also end up optimistic saying like we have the tools, they are in place. We have, for example, satellite imagery and artificial intelligence to reach the targets we already set. Now we only need to apply them. This is our website where you can have a further look and we are looking forward to the Q&A <clears throat> and I would like to hand over to Eric first. Thank you. So thank you, um, Julika, and um, uh, very pleased to be here to talk about uh, important marine mammal areas or IMAs and how they uh, interface with um, space whale and, and all the advantages that space whale can offer. So marine mammals, as, you, as um, Julika said, are indicator species, arguably the best we have, and they really come into their own when you start talking about it, identifying marine life from space because they're air breathing uh, and they're very large. Uh, well, many of them are. Uh, and they they just, you know, where they go, what they do, if they're healthy, we can get an idea um, that the rest of the sea may be healthy. Um, at the same time, we have huge gaps. As Julika said, 80% of the ocean unexplored uh, in terms of knowing how many whales there are out there uh, what they're doing and where they are, especially in the offshore. So this was really a driving factor um, for developing important marine mammal areas uh, because I did a book called Marine Protected Areas for Whales, Dolphins, and Porpoises about 10 years ago. And uh, this map is uh, uh, an output from that book, um, which talks about um, uh, which marine protected areas have some kind of cetacean habitat uh, or some uh, amount of cetacean habitat. Um, and then this was expanded also to include marine mammals. Um, and then um, it also uh, shows in the tan area some of the um, uh, ecologically or biologically significant areas of, of CBD with cetacean habitat. But what we found was that most of these areas are uh, political or socioeconomic uh, in the sense that they might have started with a habitat um, for whales or other marine mammals, but then they were whittled down through the political process and um, uh, didn't um, cover very much. In fact, most of them are coastal or right around islands. So there's the great uh, open sea that isn't covered at all. Um, and um, we also found by going to some of these EPSA meetings of the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, which we got to, you know, we didn't do it right in the beginning, but the marine, you know, some of us working on marine mammals started going uh, partway through with limited amounts of data that, we, that were not very coordinated. And we realized that we needed a tool for identifying um, marine mammals that could be used globally in that process as a layer, very much like the bird people have done with important bird areas. We talked to them a lot and we realized that they had a handle on this. So in 2013, we set up this task force through the IUCN um, and we, we extended it to all marine mammals, not just whales and dolphins, but not, you know, whales and dolphins are 
94 of the spe of the 135 species, so it's most of them. Um, and um, put together a group, and initially just two or three of us, and now the IMA Secretariat, which we is what, what we call it, is eight people um, really working um, a good part of the time, um, year in and year out, to identify uh, IMAs. And we had all these objectives for the task force, but really this last objective to enhance capacity with conservation tools is what we turn to. So important marine mammal areas, um, you can see the definition here. Um, they're not marine protected areas. They're not identified on the basis of management consideration. So this is, this is what the whales would tell us uh, they, you know, that they would want uh, uh, as their important areas. We, we try to get data to support that uh, conclusion. And the, the IMAs are um, reviewed by a panel of experts uh, we have a process of um, a lot of um, two or three, four months um, preparation for a very intensive workshop um, where we bring people together, uh, about um, 20 to 40 scientists from a given region intensively to uh, come up with candidate um, important marine mammal areas. And then those that go to the uh, peer review. So our results, we've done 10 regions uh, financed uh, largely by the um, uh, German government uh, climate initiative uh, through the Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative, but also the government of France and more recently Water Revolution Foundation. And we've come up with 280 IMAs, uh, which you can see in orange here, and 185 areas of interest, which I'll talk about a bit in a minute. And you can see all these areas on um, uh, on the website. Uh, you can see the link down below, and of course on your phone, there are bits of information on all of these um, areas uh, by clicking on the areas on the map. Um, we see these as um, feeding into various marine conservation and management initiatives. Uh, not just the EBSAs, although that was our one of our initial processes, but uh, more than 100 countries are have marine spatial planning exercises going on. And uh, we're, we, we want the layer of marine mammals to be in, in there too. And we, and we already see some pickup of countries that are doing that. Establishment of, of MPAs, um, and we've already had some impact there. And uh, also the IMO, uh, particularly sensitive sea areas. There's one now that is um, being designed in the Northwest Mediterranean that is quite exciting, which is based on an IMA that uh, uh, we identified there. And then key biodiversity areas, which is an um, umbrella um, uh, tool for all kinds of species. And there are IMAs that have been made into KBAs as well. Then you can see on the right with the... Um, uh, the, the various logos there, IBAT and Proteus, I'll draw your attention to those because they're business um, related, um, uh, they, um, you know, for environmental impact assessments and for work that goes on at sea. And we've got our IMA layers into both of those, as well as just going in this week to Global Fishing Watch, which is a great site for monitoring fishing activities. Um, at sea, but having the IMA layer underneath those is going to be really valuable. We've had more than 725 downloads of the shapefile uh, layer to date uh, by a wide range of, of um, groups and individuals and organizations, um, including the U.S. Navy and other navies. I think six navies now are, have downloaded IMA layers to inform uh, sonar, their testing of sonar. The CMS has a resolution which has been really useful in terms of implementation of IMAs in country waters, and um, uh, more than you know, 50 scientific papers since 2016 mentioning IMAs, and quite a few. It's uh, even in the last year, two or three years, it's really growing. And these are just our performance indicators. I've sort of mentioned most of those, but I'll draw your attention to the 
percent of examined area covered by Imas now is is um, coming up to three quarters of the ocean. Um, but no, the percent of global waters examined three quarters. The examined area covered by Imas is only thirteen percent. So we're still dealing with a lot of gaps out there, and we're nowhere near the thirty by thirty. Um, Oh yeah, I wanted to um, talk about the briefly the percent of Imas in EEZs, EEZs, and uh, high seas. Um, you can see the high seas is forty three percent. It looks high, but a lot of that is the Antarctic, the Southern Ocean. So, uh, if once you get up into the um, Atlantic and Pacific and Indian, there's not much that we have on the high seas. So that is really one of our big gaps. Uh, so this is what it looks like in terms of what we've done. And the blue area is where we're going to be in May um, with a workshop uh, in Mexico to cover that area with scientists. And uh, we don't know about the other areas yet. We haven't raised the funds for it, but we're, um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to keep going um, to finish the ocean. So 57% uh, in EEZs, uh, and 43% in the, on the high seas, as I said, indicates the huge gaps that space whale can help us with. And this is really, um, you know, we see this, we're still thinking ourselves, of course, about identifying. So that's, it's really important in terms of continuing this process, because after we, even after we finish the, um, um, all the regions, we want to go back and, and redo it and expand it, of course, and things are changing because of climate change and everything else. The 185 areas of interest are really important uh, because these are targeted for um, further study. You know, they, they could become IMAs, but they need more data. So that, you know, all those areas, if we had the money and the, uh, you know, there was the, there were the programs to do the, to study those by satellites, it could be incredibly valuable. Uh, we, we also need to look at um, the paths of large baleen whale migrations. You know, we know endpoints in a lot of ways, and we're getting some idea from satellite tagging, but uh, there's some huge gaps there. And of course, identification of other species, estimating abundance. And uh, so the satellite photos really can help in terms of the identification of future images which will then shape uh, marine protected areas and marine spatial planning. Now, I separated this out. The monitoring <clears throat> of uh, IMAs um, is really a tool um, that um, is really something that Space Will can help with. Um, I think there's been one, one or two papers on that already, monitoring in Antarctica. But it's uh, that's something that... Um, uh, we see in terms of the global fishing effort, it's not just monitoring the whales, but monitoring the impacts on whales, you know, what we can see happening to them, you know, that can be revealed by, by satellite photos. So that, I think that's going to be a very important um, use of this. You know, we, I think um, many of the marine protected area people had discussions um, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago about how, how are we ever going to monitor on the high seas? Well, this, you know, this coming online could be something that um, with satellite uh, monitoring could be uh, incredibly valuable. And then finally, implementing IMAs with the help of Space Whale. Um, it will help with, um, it can potentially help with enforcement, um, you know, overlaying ship traffic on the migration routes and where they go through IMAs uh, to reveal, um, you know, real important points where um, um, there could be some, um, th there could be negative impacts. Uh, finding other whale species. Um, again, estimating abundance. So I think the implementing uh, is something that's um, you know, MPA managers and marine spatial planners are going to see um, as a future incredibly valuable use. So these are just, um, this is just our side of the, um, some of the areas that um, Julika was talking about um, in terms of monitoring um, what's going on. And, and this is just to say that 
we have this wealth of background information and connections with the researchers on the ground from having done all these um, workshops around the world and worked on these imas uh, for months at a time. So I, I think this is going to be the fact that we have the connection from space to on the ground uh, can really help facilitate some of that. So just looking at um, future value of space whale for IMAs and MPAs, I think this is the success of all this is going to depend on fostering close links with researchers, as I just said, and integrating all these diverse data platforms. In a sense, that's what IMAs try to do already, although we we haven't started using um, data from from uh, the um, satellites yet. But um, that's, you know, integrating all that and making it work, just, just as um, Julika was saying from New Zealand, where it was a perfect match. I mean, there are probably going to be lots of places where it's not going to be a perfect match, but, but um, we'll have to in, figure out a way to rationalize that and then fit it in with what we know from passive acoustic monitoring and all the other tools that we have. Um, I think we're going to need access to thousands to millions of times more photographs. This kind of scares me. And I I'm probably scares Julika too and, and Carol. The cost of images has to be reduced or provided free, or there have to be some massive budgets. Um, the AI component, um, you know, continuing to improve, I think is gonna be important. Maybe, maybe in time, uh, some of the, um, you know, lesser, not so high resolution photographs will prove to be even useful and they're a lot cheaper um, if the uh, AI continues to grow uh, in its value. And, and of course, links to satellite companies to provide more access to the 30 centimeter. And I put a big question mark here in time, 10 centimeter images. Julika is going to laugh at that. I didn't clear any of this with Julika before, before uh, saying it. But you know, I think you know we think about um, uh, our cameras on our phones. You know, increasing in in resolution every two years, and you think about um, Elon Musk putting up fifty satellites at one go on one ship, one rocket, and and we know that the the skies are being, you know, filled with. with isn't it going that way? I mean, that's one going to be one of my questions um, as we continue with the webinar, um, because um, that's going to change the game completely. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Eric, and thank you, Shalika. Um, so we have a lot of questions, and we'll uh, the great questions, and we'll try to get as many as possible. Um, one of the first ones I wanted to approach, I actually wanted to um, lump uh, several questions that are on the extensibility of this work. So I'll, I'll read you three questions altogether. Um, one was, could this process be used to identify the larger sharks that come to the surface? Another was, let's see. Um, could this be a feasible tool for studying manatee populations in tropical waters since they also have to breathe on the surface? And we also had, Julika, do you, you mentioned images of dolphins as well. Do you have a space dolphin project as well? Uh, would you consider ex exploring something with river dolphins in the muddy waters of the Amazon? So I was just wondering what you could say about the extensibility of these techniques for other species. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So what we mainly say is that we can detect whales which are larger than nine meters. And obviously for us, it's not important if it's a whale or if it's a shark, it just needs to be, uh, to come on the water surface. Um, so we can generally detect animals which come to the water surface and then larger than nine meters. However, we can also detect smaller animals. But then in these cases, there are some conditions because what we mainly say is nine meters because I showed you, for example, the blue whale and what you mainly can see that you can only see parts of the whales. And this is why we say nine meters because you will, if you have a nine meter whale, 
I'm sure in the satellite imagery, you won't see the nine meter whale, but only parts of the nine meter whale. But we can also detect smaller um, whales and dolphins. And this is also what we have already done. So we have already seen some dolphins, but in this case, for example, if you have dolphins, it's important that it's not a single dolphin, but it might rather be a group of dolphins. And this is what we detected in satellite imagery. But then, of course, for us, it's also more difficult to identify the species. So what we then can only say, well, it's a group of dolphins. Um, we can also detect single animals which are larger than nine meters if they have a specific color. For example, beluga whales with their white color, they are amazing for satellite imagery. Um, even Risso dolphins, when they are juveniles, they are quite dark and grayish. But we think that when they are adults, they are just like getting more scars, which are quite white. So this is also perfect for satellite imagery. Um, so we can also see these kinds of animals. Um, so you can just like, because there was say like sharks, manatees, dolphins, these are our general routes. So you can make up your mind yourself. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I could, another... I could add, oh, go ahead, I could add yeah. to that a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, you know, sharks, you know, the, the exciting thing is that you can see below the water to some extent. So some of the sharks that are in the top layers, you probably could see, and then you could, Potentially, you know, if you're talking about whale sharks and basking sharks, um, that could be a good example um, of ones that, you know, you could um, use the technique for and then do a calculation for, you know, how often they're at the surface versus down below. I think Amazon River dolphins is going to be very, very tough, you know, not just the size, but the, uh, well, it's the contrast partly. I mean, it's exciting that, um, in the Antarctic, um, the, those emperor penguin colonies were discovered using satellites. Was it emperor penguins? Yeah, Peter Fretwell. Um, and so, you know, you, you quite small um, creatures can be seen against if there's a contrast to, and if it's in a group, as Judica said. Thanks. And if okay. I'm at, at oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. And if I might add something, so um, this is all what we said is now with 30 centimeter resolution. Obviously, as Eric already said, like it was already announced that in 2024, so this year, 10 centimeter resolution will be commercially available. So not only for the military, but really commercially available. Obviously, obviously there might be some delays, but it is already announced that there will be 10 centimeter resolution coming up very soon. And this, of course, really also gives us further opportunities opportunities into uh, going more into like smaller uh, cetacean species, like also smaller dolphin species. So this is only state of the art saying like nine meters and above. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we look forward to seeing what can be done with this new technology. Um, question that's come up a lot, um, and Eric touched on it, um, is about the affordability of the satellite imagery. So I'm gonna read three of the questions. Um, right now. One was, how did you manage to acquire large data sets of high resolution imagery for training your detection model? Did you set up some kind of contract or agreement with Maxar? Do they somehow support environmental nonprofit research? Normally, most high resolution and very high resolution data products are quite pricey and not really affordable for small NGOs, et cetera. And another question was, as a global conservation and science community, how can we get past the major barrier of the cost of tasking and accessing satellite imagery? Thanks. And another, let's see, procurement of satellite imagery costs a lot. How do you make the project sustainable in terms of the finances? So some big questions there. I can start on this question or Eric, it to you. Yeah, okay. so. What the first question also touched a bit upon, upon our tasking. So what we mainly do is that we first of all set up our study areas um, and then task the satellite provider. And actually these are commercial satellite providers like Maxar, Airbus and so on. So we do a contract with them saying, okay, please do a tasking within a six or eight week tasking period and collect the data. Because of course, if there are clouds, um, we cannot use the satellite imagery. So we usually have a time frame where the tasking is going on and 
then we know um, we just like get information. Okay, we did a tasking, but there were clouds, or we did a tasking and amazing weather conditions. So we get um, get some feedback, and this is how we mainly like use our yeah, large data sets. But obviously, you're absolutely right. The price really is an issue for scaling for us. So um, this is why we are always searching for really partners to really make this feasible. Because I mean, like artificial intelligence is really just like decreasing our personal costs because we only need the manual review so we can really scale. But the price of satellite imagery, this really is the hindering factor for us for scaling. Okay, thank you. Eric, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, no, no, I mean, that was my questions at the end. I, I, we need millions more photographs and, it, and they're expensive. And I think we, you know, we're, the work through Deloitte, um, through a special project, um, has been helpful and some of the other collaborations that uh, Julika and um, Carol and uh, BioConsult have been able to set up. Um, but it's, um, you know, I think it's really important what they're doing in terms of getting these things going. And hopefully the price is coming down, you know, over time, you know, and the, that's wonderful news. I hadn't heard that, that 2024, the, the 10 centimeter are going to be commercialized. So maybe the 30 centimeter will come down in price. That's the way things usually go. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not pro probably practical for small NGOs, unless you can talk to Unless you've got a friend in Naxar or Airbus and you can start talking to them and you know, you know, that's that's limiting. Okay. All right. Thank you, Eric. Um, another question, uh, what machine learning algorithm are you using to detect the whales in the satellite images? We use FASTA RCNN. Um, if you need any further information, you can also actually find some papers what we did. So on our webpage, you can also, um, we explained like how we, for example, downsampled our aerial imagery, what kind of algorithm we use. And this is the information we publish about our algorithm. So everything is also on our webpage. Thank you very much. Um, there were questions both about, in um, whether you can identify entangled whales and stranded cetaceans. Let me read those questions. Um, have images ever identified entangled whales? If so, this could be a useful tool for quantifying entanglement rate, rates and deploying disentanglement teams in areas where teams could get to these whales. Obviously not in the high seas, but more in coastal areas. And then there was a, a question, has there been any work done on the feasibility of using satellite imagery to monitor cetacean strandings in remote areas, particularly with regard to monitoring transboundary UMEs or mass strandings? Yeah, so at least I'm not aware that there has been a satellite image where there has been seen an entangled whale. And I also think this is quite difficult with the 30 centimeter resolution, seeing really the entanglement. So I think this might be rather something for 10 centimeter resolution, for example. Um, but yeah, of course, there is really some research also going on on stranded whales and how to see them in satellite imagery. Um, we've mainly focused on the whales alive, but yeah. There are other institutions which also do stranded whales. All right, thank you. Um, question, can the algorithm be used for those free images from Landsat or any other satellite imagery source? That would be amazing, but due to the resolution, we really need to use the commercial providers which have these pricey images. So like Airbus, um, Pleiades Neo Satellite or the World View 2 or 3 Satellite by Maxer. So with the um, satellite imagery available from, um, which are freely available, we cannot see the ways we see, uh, as we see in our imagery. So unfortunately not. Okay. Um, there were a lot questions related to um, tasking schedule. So uh, one, what is a typical average tasking schedule of pictures for a specific area? So what we mainly do is, first of all, we are in touch with our partner or client. So um, and then, of course, it's really 
a kind of so every project is really different so for example within our study in mexico actually we did several data collections within the same area and then also comparing numbers between two different days of data collection or for example in new zealand we actually did two data collections like one in 2020 uh, 20, and one data collection in 2020 22 um so it really depends so this is why we are usually first of all in contact with a client and then um what we try to figure out is like what kind of aim do you really have like do you need several data collections or do you need one large snapshot um of one large area um so what we then do is we just like suggest a study area, suggest a tasking period. And then, first of all, we go back to the satellite provider and ask for a feasibility study. Because as I already said, like if there is a lot of cloud, in, uh, if there are a lot of clouds in the area, it might be difficult for the tasking. Or also, if there's a lot of military activity, we are not allowed to buy the satellite imagery. So this is why the satellite provider then gives us back a kind of feasibility, how feasible our study is, and then we start the tasking and from the start of the contact with the client until st uh, start of the tasking is usually like six to eight weeks for the feasibility study and so on and what we then mainly have is like six to eight weeks for the feasibility uh, for the tasking so really data collection because for example, the WorldView 3 satellite, this really is only one satellite. So it's not a kind of satellite, constel satellite constellation, but it's only one single satellite. And this satellite is just like going around the Earth every day. So every day it's at about 1030 be above you. So irrespectively of where you are, local time for you, it's 1030 above you. Um, so we only have one data collection per day which is possible but then obviously there's also some competition between the clients for satellite imagery so for sure you won't get in a six to eight week tasking period one satellite data collection every day because the satellite might just like do a tasking in this area or then this area and it's too fast for doing every tasking every day so this is why we usually like get once or twice a week a satellite image and then what we then do we wait until the end of the tasking period so this is i mean um, eric already just like showed you the study areas and we already saw some really nice test images um or some previews but um we haven't bought any satellite imagery yet because data collection is still running and we are waiting until the end of the data collection is running to really get the best satellite image. Obviously, we would love to buy every satellite image, but since it's so expensive, we really only choose the best satellite image. Um, and then when once we have bought the satellite image, we run our algorithm, do the menu review, and then it also takes like eight to 10 weeks to really until you get the report with everything. Okay, thank you, Shulika. Um, another question that's come up, uh, will satellite imagery render field ecology obsolete or is ground truthing still a necessity despite our advancements? I feel like with no methodology, you can replace another methodology, just like general in science. And I think that Spacewell is amazing in terms of complementing data where you can also go by boat, because every methodology there you have to kind of bias. So for example, with passive acoustic monitoring, not every animal might vocalize. So you will miss some animals. And also with satellite imagery, you will only capture the animals which are at the surface. So with every method, you have some disadvantages so for getting the best picture it would always be best to just like use every methodology um but then of course with space well we can also go into areas where we cannot go by boat because it's just like too expensive and too time consuming because they are too far offshore so i think if there are areas where you can also go by boat it would be amazing just like using space well for complementing the data, we can also collect by traditional survey methods. But if there are areas where you cannot go by boat, it's amazing that you can at least collect some baseline data. Can I Thank add you, to Shirley. that? I mean, Please. Can I add, yeah. I mean, in terms of field ecology, it's there's no way it would ever replace that because you, you're talking about, you know, what we learned from photo ID and from, um, 
and genetics um, on the ground. Um, there's no way that space photos are going to do that. Um, so there's a whole raft of, of behavioral and um, um, all kinds of things that 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 it will you know the the culture of of whales and the songs and all of that you know none of that touches on um, what we can learn from space or none of it can be revealed by what we learn from space so so I wouldn't worry you're not out of a job soon great <clears throat> thank you guys um on the question of sort of validation and, and sort of processing um does that Oh, no, actually, that's not the question I want. There was a question of whether um, for the New Zealand, yes, okay. Whales aren't always at the surface, but the New Zealand study got similar figures. Are you satisfied you found all the whales or do you somehow uh, factor in a figure for subsurface whales? Yeah, so the New Zealand study was amazing. We were also really, to be honest, it was kind of even a way too good for us <laughs> because I mean like 41 southern right whales in satellite imagery 41 southern right whales on the boat we were like wow we did not expect this um even though in this area we expected similar numbers because when southern right whales this is a breeding area so when southern right whales breed they are often on the water surface so this is why we know that most of the whales are in this kind of stage on the water surface um, and then, of course, you can see them really well by boat as well as by satellite. But of course, if you have other feeding or if you have other behaviors like feeding and if you have other species, you will always have a bias because you will only just like see parts of the population. Um, so, yeah, it was amazing that we validated the methodology, but um, we will not get absolute abundance numbers saying like, OK, you have like. 15 blue whales in particular in this area because we can only count the whales which are on the water surface so you will always just like miss some whales which are beneath the water surface and I know there's also some research going on how to actually calculate correction factors and so on but this really is just like an ongoing process so there has not been the final correction factor yet because it really depends on the species it depends on the area it depends on the behavioral stage and um, there are so many factors which need to take to uh, take into account so there has to be so much field work going on to really just like calculate these factors okay thank you Shrita. um there was there have been a couple of questions um can you get behavioral data such as mating and feeding from the satellite imagery so we as i said so what we mainly see so what we for example see is okay, the humpback whale is flapping its uh, flipper on the water surface. Or for example, you have a combination of a calf and a mother. But um, what we do not really provide is, okay, we have like this amount of, or this number of animals which are actually doing this behavioral stage and this behavioral stage, because then it's just like going so much into the ecological um, field. And as said already, satellite imagery is only a snapshot that we really provide baseline data on how many whales there are in certain areas, like at least um, where they are most, um, these kind of information. Okay. Um, I'm going to lump a couple questions about um, looking for the presence of whales in sort of specific areas. One is, what are the challenges using satellite imagery to track the presence of whales in the area of an oil spill? That is, can you access satellite imagery for targeted areas? And another question, um, thank you, Julika and Eric, for the interesting presentation. Could space whale methodology be used to monitor whale presence along a shipping route? So using multiple images in space and time. Yes, we can. So regarding shipping lanes, for example, of course, when we know, okay, this is an area where we have a lot of shipping, we can also task the satellite, okay, please just like collect data over this area. And then we can collect, for example, saying, okay, we are going to buy several satellite imagery from different days. And then it's always a snapshot from 10 to 30 local time. So if you have ships, for example, which are more in the evening there in this area, you might not see this, but it's always a snapshot from 10.30. Um, and sure, you can also just like 
um, have a look on other data. Um, and we, you can also just like do immediate tasking. For example, what we once did is that we know there was a really an aggregation of fin whales in an area. So we tasked the satellite and just like try to just like get also satellite imagery because we were contacted by people which were on the ground. Um, and we were not able to get that satellite just like due to the weather, but usually we or if we would have been lucky, we would have received the satellite image. And this is also so if there's any kind of event, obviously, you can always immediately immediately task the satellite. But then, of course, there are also some challenges if you don't have the specific tasking period and um, that there might be some clouds, for example, um, that you cannot get your satellite imagery. and. You also, for example, if you now notice, oh, like two weeks ago, there was this interesting event, um, you might not get any data because there's not just like a huge um, amount of archive data. So there's only archive data where people already did a task at least above the ocean. So, I mean, satellite providers do some just like taskings where, for example, from Rome, because there are a lot of people who might be interested in buying a satellite imagery from Rome. So even if there's not a tasking above Rome, they might just like take a satellite imagery. But if it's just like an area, just like an ocean area, um, there are not that many people who will buy the satellite imagery. So they don't do this kind of tasking, just like saying, okay, let's just like take a satellite imagery from the ocean. And um, there might be somebody coming up like in two years who might be interested in the satellite imagery. Okay. Yes. Okay. And that sort of addresses another question we had. Thank you, Shurika. Um, I'm going to group a couple more questions. So one was a fun question. Have you found an animal in a place you wouldn't expect yet? Any exciting surprises? And another was, have you had any success spotting really hard to study species such as beaked whales from space? Maybe, maybe Carol can answer. <clears throat> yeah, hi. Um, I'm also <laughs> bringing me in. Um, so yeah, we we thought we had seen a big whale in in an area, but we couldn't really confirm. We put it rather to a not not a definite whale or not a definite um, big whale in in that uh, part, but um, the parameters or all that around looked like this. Um, and sorry, what was the, the other question? Um, um, have there been any surprising findings? Oh, surprising, yeah. Um, yeah, so we have seen sharks, um, but we couldn't determine it to the species level, but for sure um, there has been sharks on the surface. Um, and yeah, not more really surprising uh, than that up to now. All right, thank you, Carol. Um, there's been several variations on a question just talking about long-term studies. Um, I'll, I'll read one. Um, one of the uh, key advantages would be long-term time series of relative abundance, repeatedly surveying an area over many years, assuming the same proportion of whales are seen each time uh, to monitor whether population is increasing or decreasing. Are there any plans for this sort of study? Um, we could start at any time. So yeah, that we think that's a strength of this methodology that you can actually cover like a certain areas and just continuously do it um, like either over the years or even if it's possible, like uh, every th three months or something like this. Um, yeah, we would be aiming to do this, and and uh, we think it's it's uh, totally feasible to do. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Um, looking at all the new questions, um, has your team ever caught illegal activity harming marine mammals? Are there any protocols for what to do if such an image is captured? Um. Illegal activity, no, not not so far that that we could say. Um, so you also have to um, consider that um, it takes a little while until we get the results. Um, so it, 
well, for illegal activity, of course, then there's proof of concept and um, we could go go back to this, but it would be uh, like some, some weeks later until we can uh, deliver the results. But um, yeah, up to now, we haven't seen anything like this. All right. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, and we are at the hour. Um, if we could just have time for one last question. Um, and I finish up from a grassroots perspective, is there anything individuals and communi communities can do right now to work towards the goal of making space whale more financially sustainable and viable? Collaborating with us. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, um, for sure. Like we, we are really interested and we think people on the ground and the local communities know the best what's kind of in front of their um, house door. So we, we just would seek to support it and uh, give a snapshot from a larger area so you can see the connections um, of the area of interest. Um, so, yeah, I can, I think just contact us um, via our Spaceware webpage and, um, yeah, we can, can sort out something. Okay. And do you mind giving that Spaceware webpage one last time as we wrap up? Yeah, it's uh, www.spacewales.de for Germany. Um, but, uh, yeah, we can also write it in here. Okay, great. And that'll bring us to the end. Let's see, I, is it in the chat right now? Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, and I hope everyone's able to see that it's, it's the last chat up there right now. Okay, um, thank you so much, all, all of you, um, Julika, Eric, and Carolyn for a wonderful presentation. Um, there's obviously tremendous interest in this uh, technology and seeing it more widely used. Um, and we look forward to following its progress. And thank you to everyone who attended and participated and shared their information and their questions. Um, Again, you can get in touch with the Space Whale team uh, through the website. So thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Sarah, for hosting. Thank you, everybody.